Well, welcome everyone to the Herbert C. Kelman Seminar on International Conflict. And we all want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day or night or morning, whatever it happens to be, um, to be with us today. And we're we're so happy to have our friend and colleague Karen Doyle here with us today. He is both um he is a, a, a scholar, a, what do you call it? Wait a minute, a fellow in the scholars program at the Weatherhead Center. So he's one of one of our, our colleagues. And he's also no stranger to the program on negotiation because uh, they have done some training programs uh, together in uh, Maynooth University where, um, where Dr. Doyle teaches in Ireland. So we are delighted to have him here, uh, as well as delighted to have you. And let me just say um, thank you to our team here. It takes a big effort to make one of these seminars, pull one off. And we are so grateful to Nicole, Brian, to uh, James um, Kerwin, to Diane Long, to uh, Riley Schretzel, and I hope I got that right, Riley. And our newest member of the team is uh, Lindsay Sullivan. So we want to have a special welcome for her as well. But meanwhile, you're here to hear Dr. Doyle talk about uh, the EU. His title of his talk is Where Do We Fit In? Rethinking the Role of the EU in Peacebuilding, um, in peacebuilding Missions. And before we get started, before I introduce him, I just wanted to let you know the format where uh, Dr. Doyle is going to be get talking for about 35 to 40 minutes, after which we will turn it over to you, the audience, for a Q&A. And if you would, please put your questions in the Q&A function, um, and then I will take the read the questions to Dr. Doyle, and he'll answer them one by one. And, you know, we always have so many more questions than we can get to, so we apologize in advance for, for that. But... Um, Yes, let me just uh, now introduce our friend and colleague, Karen Doyle. He is an associate professor in the Department of International Development and an assistant director of the Edward M. Kennedy uh, Institute for Conflict Intervention in Maynooth University, Ireland. Uh, his teaching and research interests involve a high level of external engagement with key practitioners and organizations active in the practice of conflict intervention and development, peace building, and restorative practice. Since 2013, Dr. Doyle has served as the high uh, as the Irish uh, representative on the academic board of the European Security and Defense College. That's based in the European External Action Service in Brussels. He was co-editor um, of the Open Access Journal at, uh, of Mediation and Applied uh, Conflict Analysis. Since 2019, Dr. Doyle has reported uh, to a preparatory committee of the European Council on Mediation, Negotiation, and Dialogue Capacity in common security and de defense policy mission. So as you can see, Dr. Doyle, he's taken uh, some time off of his busy schedule in, in, uh, in, in Europe to be with us here at the Weatherhead Center for uh, several months. So we are thrilled to have him and we're sad that his time is nearly up. He's going back to Ireland in December. So um, now just enjoy, uh, enjoy the time that we have with him here uh, today, and um, we'll come back and take your questions uh, in, in, in about 40 minutes. And after at the end, I'm going to turn the session over to Nicole Bryant, who's going to just fill you in on a few uh, things that are happening around PON in the next couple of weeks. So, all right, uh, Karen, it's yours. Thanks very much. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, excellent. Excellent. Uh, Donna, thank you so much for that warm welcome. And it's great to be in the company of old friends. I, I recognize many of the names that are coming through there and sending messages. And uh, it's it's a fantastic opportunity to, I suppose, to, to greet you all again and also to fill you in on some of the work that we've been doing down, down through the years. And particularly with your 
previous connections to the Kennedy Institute in, in Ireland. So I'm going to share my screen here. I have a, a presentation. I've got plenty of uh, slides, got plenty of images, and I'll go through it very quickly. But I think the flavor of this will be in the discussion afterwards um, and your interactions and, you, and your responses, because um, ult ultimately the European Union's efforts in peace building depend on connecting people with people and people understanding the mission. And I think sometimes that's something that that um, that we um, that Europe hasn't per perhaps achieved to the extent that it could. So hopefully today we'll address some of those uh, concerns and perhaps interests that you have as well. So I'm going to share my screen here. Um, here we go. OK, and I, I, want, I want to say initially that it's, it's such a fantastic honour uh, on Donna's invitation to deliver the Herbert Kellman Seminar on International Conflicts Analysis and, and re Conflict Resolution. Um, it's, a, it's a huge high point of my, of my career to deliver this, this, this um, the seminar. And I do hope that, that it reflects the, the values and uh, the aspirations, but also the standards of excellence that, that uh, you have achieved down, down through the years. So I'm very honoured to be part of this uh, programme. So where do we fit in? Re rethinking the role of e EU conflict uh, and peace building missions. So first of all, I'll talk a little bit about the Edward Kennedy Institute. I'll talk about the EU's approach to peace building. I'll talk about the activities of the EU common security and defence policy. And I'll also talk about how, how well the, those missions have, have realised their potential. So um, that's the structure that, that we'll be following over the next four, four, 40 minutes or so. So the Edward Kennedy Institute is based in Maynooth University. It's a small university, well, relatively speaking. We have about 12 to 13,000 students. We're based about 20 kilometres from Dublin. And um, it's a, an institute funded by the Irish government primarily, but and dedicated to the memory of the Ken Kennedy family and their role in the in the Irish peace process. It was specifically named after Ted or a, a Edward Kennedy, uh, but on the insistence or on the request of um, Joan Kennedy Smith, who was ambassador to Ireland at the time, because she felt that Edward's role in the in, in the Irish peace process ne needed to be re recognised. So we work with practitioners, we develop theory through research and, and we and we teach. And we also encourage um, community engagement with, with the communities that are affected by conflict. Um, our aims are to, to build capacity for constructive approaches to conflict at all levels of society, to generate new knowledge, and perhaps to refrain existing knowledge to support communities to transcend predictable patterns of conflict and particularly you will know and be aware of the the Irish peace process so we work quite quite a bit with the with the Irish government in in the promulgation of um and theorization of uh, that that conflict and the peace process that emerged from, from that so with three key th terms we have mediation negotiation or treaty key core themes, I should say, mediation, negotiation, restorative practice, and, and peace, peace building. How do we teach? We teach mediation, negotiation, dialogue. We teach conflict analysis, teach peace processes. We teach agreement implementation. We teach conflict security and development and gender and trauma issues. So we have a wide gambit of, of programs that, that we deliver. Some of the research that has informed this teaching uh, improving the effectiveness of, of EU capabilities in conflict prevention. That was a, a piece of research that I led over a period of three years between 2015 and 2018. We were looking at the missions and how did they achieve their purpose. Gaming for Peace, we looked at how um, th that particular um, piece of piece of re uh, research where we looked to develop a curriculum for soft skills and also we've looked at conflict trauma and we have a journal of mediation and applied conflict analysis as well, which is particularly apt given, given the title of this seminar uh, series. As Donna graciously mentioned, I sit on the academic board of the European Security and Defence College for the last few years. 
and uh, also we've been involved in these these particular programs through the European Security and Defence College. The the people that come on those programs are normally U either European diplomats or people that have been deployed in European missions, uh, particularly, and sometimes European operations. The differential being there that missions would refer to civilian uh, activities and operations then would refer to military type, type activities. Primarily our teaching is, is for civilian personnel. And to date we've, we've run approximately 37 programs uh, in the in the in the in this field where people travel to Maynooth University and learn in the, the Edward Kennedy Institute in, in, in Maynooth University. So is it is it successful? People get the opportunity to learn from from those people that participated directly in the peace process. So the approach that we take is that we include people from Northern Ireland, we include people with peace building experience from Southern Ireland, and also people, voices from the, from the UK, from, 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 from England. So it's, it's a north, south, east, east, west um, dimension to our, to, to our work. Um, is it why Ireland? We have lessons of post-colonial experience of state building and also our connections between the UN and EU. And uh, is it successful? Well, we were um, we were assessed by, by the Swiss back in 2018. And they said at that time that, that we were probably le Europe's leading institution in delivering those type of um, trainings and, and educational programs. And well, the Swiss, they make watches. So, so they have to be right. So the, the work that, that I've been doing in, in this uh, field dates back approximately 20 years. I uh, was originally a, a military officer. I trained in the Irish Defence Forces, but I did a lot of my work with the French uh, military. So, so I spent a good bit of time on continental Europe and around the time there was a lot of talk about a European army, the potential of a, a, a European army. And um, I also then got to help to advise as a special advisor, the, the commander of an Irish general who headed up the EU force that deployed to Chad in the Central African Republic back in 2007, 2008. So I, I, I was his personal advisor and I traveled between Brussels, between Paris, between Chad, between Bangui in Central African Republic and, and Jemena in, in Chad and got to see firsthand the capability that, that Europe had with regards to its, its, its military deployments. So that, that's my own personal interest in this. I retired uh, from the military life uh, very soon after that. And it gave me, I suppose, a unique insight into the potential that, that Europe had with regards to making a difference and, and, and peace building across the, the, the world. So modern conflict has come in three, three waves. Struggle for independence in European colonies, You've got rival groups fighting for control of these new states and Arab Spring and the jihadism and Russian imperialism, which more, more recently. But all of these have impacted on the EU and its, its neighbourhood. It's harder to understand. Um, there's uh, Usually civil wars have for, foreign meddling largely in poor countries, especially hot ones, and it causes mi millions of deaths. Far more die from war, induced hunger and disease than from shrapnel. Um, and a number of countries, approximately 16, currently have issues where they have more than one um, f f uh, conflict going on at, at, at the same time. Why is this? We have erosion of gl global norms, and sense of impunity that people can do what they want uh, without recrimination. You have the impacts of climate change, re relig religious extremism, and organized criminality. So with regards to conflict analysis, there are four ba basic drivers that, that, that have, have been identified. Insecurity, inequality, private incentives, and perceptions. So the challenge for, for the EU is to to identify where it can fit in within those those four different dimensions 
And the, the, the top two, they're insecurity and inequality, or geopolitical or macroeconomic type, type uh, issues. And then the bottom two, private incentives and perceptions, they can be perhaps amenable to behavioral change, to, to uh, communications and even strategic communications interventions. So if, if you look at the, the context of why the, this has evolved within a European dimension, why, why is this happening now, now and how, why has it taken momentum in the, in the last 20, 20 years or so? You have the drive within Europe, I suppose, that you had this disintegration of Yugoslavia where the Euro European Union was unable really to make any great in, in, intervention you have the development of EU and NATO synergy um, going back now almost 25 years. You had the Iraq war. You have the terrorist attacks in Europe in the early 2000s. You have Kosovo, Serbia, the declaration of, of um, independence in uh, Serbia in 2008. And then you had the advent of the, the, the Treaty of Lisbon. The, the Treaty of Lisbon ha, has given a big momentum to, to, to Europe's, um, Europe's capacity to, 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 to deliver in, in, in this field. It's given a lot of energy. So it, it, it's the primary law of the European Union in this regard. It's got the Treaty of the European Union and then the Treaty on the Functioning of Europe, which are together named the Treaties of, of the European Union. So Europe's international action is framed within these principles, which have motivated its own creation, the development and enlargement and pr promotes, I suppose, the, the type of work that I will go on to uh, describe to you, for, namely democracy or promotion of democracy, rule of law, universality and indivisibility of human rights and fun fundamental freedoms and respect for the UN Charter and international law. And that, that's all contained within, primarily within Article 21 of the Treaty of the European Union. So all of that is, 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 is um, helping to, to frame Europe's actions. And you, you then had the advent of, of the Arab Spring. You had Libya uh, in 2001. And that, that was an interesting case where the language used in the, the, the Treaty of Lisbon, that, that that encouraged a wide approach to security and clearly moving away from this traditional approach of state security and focusing increasingly on the security of people. However, when the first challenge of this approach came, uh, came up, this was in, in, in Libya, which started in 2011, and critical of the lack of momentum and reluctance to initiate revolving the issue, uh, France, uh, uh, alongside the UK at the time, pressed for military uh, in, in intervention. So that kind of set the scene for for, um, for future, um, I suppose, criticism of the EU response, which which um, was quite high level, but but didn't actually make make a, a great a great intervention on 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 the, um, the the situation you also had the advent of georgia then and and, and the uk uh, uh, sorry U ukraine i should say uh, uh, and the the determination of the european council that uh, it wanted to reinforce this security and defense capacity because as opposed to following the the libyan crisis they they, they felt that that the, it needed a further st strategic Im impetus you then had the 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 additional um terrorist attacks in brussels and paris the refugee crisis in 2016 and the eu then set out a strategy in 2016 called its global strategy. And that was very much about articulating an uh, ambitious geopolitical EU role in the world and put forward co com common actions. You had the challenge of COVID-19 and I suppose the relative success within the European community that they were able to manage, you know, this, the, the, a, a community wide response to, to vaccinations and the types of interventions that were made. 
fallout from Brexit and that's that uh, whole this this commoting or or this on, on I suppose the danger was that you were going to there would be copycats or that this would unhinge the, the European project which which thankfully it didn't the Afghanistan um, withdrawal and the, the the inability I suppose to, of, of the liberal approach to to um, copper fasten itself within um, Af Afghanistan, that was another ma ma major crisis. But it, it was a crisis where the European Union um, partners and member states acted, generally speaking, together in, in, in order to coordinate the, the, the withdrawal of those that were either part of the European community or had associations with the European community. And then you had the advent of, of the Ukraine uh, war, or the UK, Ukraine at, at attack by, by, by Russia, I should say. And this has served to copper fasten European resolve within security and defence matters. So what does that look like now? What, what do our missions look like? So despite the EU being perceived as predominantly an economic actor, the scale of this ambition is significant. In total, 37 missions and operations have deployed in three continents since 2003. And I think that's an important point to, to be cognizant of, that really that this work has only started in back in, in um, 2003. Last or this year earlier, we, we celebrated in the Kennedy Institute, we, we celebrated the 20th anniversary. Most of, of the, the European Union missions, and you will see them indicated there on the map, there's 12 on, ongoing civilian missions. Most of them have been in the area of rule of law and governance. So there's a developing operation capacity, which is enhanced by two what's known as civilian compacts now, where the, the, the governments, uh, as in decision through the EU Council, ha, have uh, decided that even though there are challenges, including member state commitment, operational capacity, historical and colonial memories, doctrinal gaps, recruitment of per mission personnel and challenges, that these missions and operations, that they, they are worthy of, of, of shoring up and they're worthy of continuous de deployment. So how do, how do they work? They, they, they mostly promote human rights, rule of law, crisis management, building police capacity missions, and civil protection missions. They have aspired to local ownership, promoted in that, that, um, that would work through development, diplomacy, and common security and defense policy on locally uh, security sector reforms. And, and the, the trust of this work being in support of SDG 16, that's uh, the, the UN development goals, that they would aspire to creating strong institutions that, that would support um, the, the capacity of, of, of countries to, to organize uh, and to, 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 to build the, 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 their uh, own forms of governance. They work on the integrated approach which is multi-phased, it's multi-dimensional, and it's multilateral. And that's essentially that the EU can act at all stages of conflict uh, cycle. The multi-dimensional, it brings in all different policies, such as, our as I mentioned, the diplomatic, our diplomatic in engagement, the missions, the development cooperation, and the humanitarian assistance. It's multi-level, it addresses the complexity of the compact, uh, of the conflict at local, national, and uh, regional level. And it's multilateral, engaging all actors present in the conflict. So it's about creating strong link linkages through, through this integrated approach. Typical type of work that it would do, disarmament, de de demobilization, control of small arms, mine action programs, peace mediation and dialogue, transitional justice measures, support to parliaments, support for elections and security sector reform. Here's an example in, in the Horn of Africa of the 
different types of of missions that that and that come under the integrated approach. So you've got um, a development program, you've got educational programs, you have humanitarian aid, you have ca capacity building, for example, for the 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 Somalia. Um, Coast Guard to stop piracy. You have a stronger naval capacity to 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 um, dissuade uh, piracy along the Indian Ocean. You have an EU training uh, mission in in Somalia that that is helping the fight against Al Shabaab. And uh, as I said to you, you, as I said to you, you also have the humanitarian aid uh, as required. So you have rule of law, building institutions, security sector reform, and mine operations. So that's quite a bit of, uh, of, of, of activity. In total, you would have approximately 4,000 people deployed across the globe working on the, the, these different missions. They work with partners, uh, Eastern Partnership, uh, more in, we'd say in Georgia, and then w w w and Moldova, and countries so Ukraine as well, um, and these would be countries that would have aspirations to join the EU in in in, in the future. So our study between two thousand and fifteen and two thousand and eighteen, so that they, they were a vital contributor to international peace and stability, and their their visibility needed to be strengthened. They work through the theory of change. In, in other words, they 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 will consider well how best can can we contribute to to this and how best can we contribute to development and development through 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 security so it's it's very much about about um, um finding what that country needs and then designing the the type of inter in, in, intervention and this is a developing capacity within the EU because up to this point it has been quite I suppose challenging to always align the mission with what was actually required and in our studies between 2015 and 2018 we found that of the eight missions that that we studied only two had actually um, been systematic in its um, interactions with, with its host nation. So much of this le left a little bit of room for improval of where the EU could, could promote the concept of human security as a comprehensive and in integrated fashion, but most of all, people-centered approach. So that, that that's a continuous challenge. And the, the challenge is to ask ourselves, well, why are we doing this and how are people benefiting fr fr from this. And this was referred to in a bigger dimension by Ursula van, van, van der Leyen, who, who was president of the, of, the, of the EU Commission. And she said in her, in her address to the Union, she said that Europe needs a soul. Europe needs an ideal and a more, more a bigger sort of reflection on the political values that, that, that uh, serve the European ideal. And we do things, we do resume virtues very, very well. But ultimately, do we do the eulogy virtues where, where you know, the, the, the type of work that, that Europe has been doing, is it resonating with, with people on the ground? And when I say on the ground, I, I mean those that are working in administrative or security dimensions or, or even wider citizenship, that they actually feel that the person that from Europe that's there is there to help them rather than as some form of a political gesture on behalf of Europe that has this operational capacity, but ultimately it's it's about Europe making a statement by, by being there. So I think the challenge there is that that there, there are dimensions of the decision making where it's removed from from, from, from the type of work that we do. And sometimes Europe itself can be a little bit uh, disjointed in 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 the way that that it um, makes us uh, in the way in in that it's thinking. So obviously, it's it's the epitome of the multilateral approach, but not everybody thinks the same with, with it 
within the European project. And it might look different from the outside looking in, but inside it, it can be, you know, a hugely political in, in, environment. And also how we project ourselves and even at a, at a human level, you know, the, the European Union attracts some really competent and well-meaning people. But wh when we are efficient and when we are, you know, determined through our sense of, I suppose, managerialism that, that we bring to these missions, how are we connecting with, 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 with pe people on, on, on the ground? And it is a politicized environment, as, as I referred to just there, that those that are leading the missions, well, they have a lot of balls to, to keep it, keep, keep, keep in the air. They, they have to manage their political masters in, 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 in Brussels. They have the, the pressures of, of member states. And, uh, you know, you, you also have the internal d dimensions of, of, of the, the missions themselves. And an example that, that you could... Um, that you could give us in in our research we saw that the EU has a mission in well, it actually has two missions in in, in Palestine, but uh, respondents said at the time that the EU lacked information and knowledge on what happens in in, in the occupied Palestinian territories as, as they're referred to. It said that EU cops the mission seemed to pay no attention to human rights violations and uh, the excessive use of force by police against peaceful demonstrators during strikes or that it was not aware of the needs of the district district police stations and the difficulties police and judges encounter so it is quite quite a, a difficult um i suppose environment in in which to 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 make an opportunistic to an opportunistic uh difference and um very often locals themselves have very little capacity and no, no agreement on how to move forward, which can make kind of ownership of, of the, the, the peace building uh, domain. It can make that qu quite difficult. It's not a virgin birth. There is a history. There is, um, there is much um, historical Re resonances and the, the, there is always this 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 fear that uh, it's an us and them when you're dealing with the, the host nation and uh, that you know the, the, this notion that 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 we might know best and here within the liberal um, institutions that the, we, we, we uh, have the solution for, for, for all your problems Um. Also, maybe the expectations as well that the host governments have that once an EU deploy, uh, mission deploys, well, then you know, it just may not have the capacity. Very, very often, as I mentioned, you know, if 4,000 people deployed over that number of missions, there's approximately 20 at the moment. You know, you're talking about a couple of hundred people. For, for, for example, uh, in Afghanistan, there was about 150 operational staff and the police force that they were dealing with had uh, 150,000 of a staff. So in a lot of ways, it, it was um, it, its resources were, 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 were quite limited. So why aren't they, 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 they working? Uh, that they felt that they need, a, 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 needed to invigorate their public diplomacy efforts. It needed to be stronger uh, on on the ground and to be seen as as uh, somebody that was acting um, in, in the best interests uh, of, of the people of the co country, not just self interested elites. And the thing is that nobody will remember, you know, the the, the wider or so the technical dimensions of 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 what you teach, but people will remember the way that you connect with them. And there there are very often there's humiliation just to very have an EU mission in in, in sight, and uh, it's 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 important that that a, a, em, empathy um, is shown. And the Gaming for Peace project, which we we spent two years studying between 2017 and 2019, we, we studied this area. It said that a deep analysis of political, strategic, and security culture, along with the cul cultural dynamics and co conflicts is required, and that mission personnel must be able to predict second and third order effects of actions 
So it's not about just what you're doing for that year or year or two that you're deployed. You have to be able to think further down the, the, the tracks and see how this is going to impact on, on, on people. So the potential role of mediation, negotiation and dialogue skills. This is something that I, I report to the EU civilian training group, which are part of CIVCOM, the preparatory body of the EU Council. And the, I felt that that by by uh, exploiting the EU concept, which was first brought in 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 twenty um, twenty, it's sorry, its revised version was brought in in twenty twenty, but this this saw the role of mediation, negotiation, dialogue as an expression of Europe's values across the the wider domain of the type of interventions that that Europe make. It saw so these skill sets has been really important to get a greater connection with the, with the people that they're, they're, they're working with. And um, it, 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 you know, the, 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 the visual image of people actually interacting with, with each other, be it, we we'll say, on the left-hand side there where you have a high-level uh, mediation, and on the right-hand side where you have one of the peace-building missions, where you just show an interest in people and working through their problems on the ground, that that actually what was a very, very powerful image for, for Europe to be sending out. The key findings that that, that research brought forward was that, was that the EU already uses a lot of mediation, negotiation, and dialogue capacity. It uses it to collaborate with third parties and missions where it isn't part of the mandate, well, it's seen as a need, and it's central to horizontal working. And when it did this research, almost 50% of people said, well, no, we don't do mediation, negotiation and dialogue. But when you asked them a further questions about their actual work, it was completely apparent, apparent that this type of work was part of their core, core business. So a, a, a word cloud there is, is, is quite interesting that it, it brings forward words like you know, facilitation, local, whatever, and essentially means that the European mission, instead of focusing on, uh, or what it thought its focus was, on this technical capacity, was actually doing an awful lot of work that that uh, meant that it, it, it was um, an actor as opposed to a, um, a, a teacher or an imparter imparting knowledge. And who were they doing it with? It? They were doing it among themselves quite quite a bit. So if you look at the figure figures there, 42% um, state and local government, that was with the host nation. And the migrant issues were were were, were that 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 required some mediation, negotiation, dialogue as well. But actually, almost 50 or over 50% of the work that that they were doing was horizontal. It was among the international community. It was among the intra-agency approach, the application of the, the integrated approach that Europe ha has been aspiring to. And that the, uh, the, the organizational egos and the organizational, the challenges of organizational working were, were causing uh, a lot of internal strife within the missions. So... What type of communication activities were there? Were were, were the, the these skill sets imparting or, or facilitating? You know, general conversations, managing of crisis that could be anything from a, an outbreak of violence uh, within their vicinity, or you know so, some kind of crisis among uh, de delivery of 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 um, humanitarian aid, or or or, or true true put or. or or pa pa passage of, of, of that humanitarian aid, dealing with freedom of movement, uh, in, interactions then with lo local stakeholders. So the, these were the types of activities. The outcomes were almost unanimous, unanimously uh, positive, that they enhanced personal communications, greater trust, and re resolution of legal disputes. So in other words, when you use those skill sets, it made you a stronger actor to fulfill the mandate of, of, of your mission. So the, 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 this uh, EU mediation concept suggests that CSDP missions have a part to, to engage in mediation relevant, relevant tasks and to, to um, support track one level talks. 
And Northern Ireland would be an example of this now, where we had two distinct strands of peace negotiations. You had the political issues, but then you had the security issues. And if you were to look at if, if there was anything, I suppose, missing from the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland, you had a great, uh, or you had a, a solution to its, its legislative challenges and, and a representation of communities within the Legislative Assembly. However, where it may have fallen down was in the determination, or sorry, the, the, in the design of interact, intersections of, within communities. That the, the, these type of, of community uh, locations where people could meet and talk and be, be comfortable in each other's company in a natural environment, that that didn't arise from, from, from the Good Friday Agreement. So that requires little micro-level interventions on the ground, particularly by political parties. And that, that's what has happened over the, over the years, and it's seen the transformation of, of, of uh, parties that were marginal and, that are, and have now been brought into the centre to do, doing these little micro Diplomacies help, help, helping people uh, with with the issues that 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 they that they encounter in in their daily lives. So the philosophy behind this, but if you're when you're making plans, think big. When you're making progress, think small. And also not to forget that people exist in networks, and our focus as peace builders that we have on track one, track two, track three, or maybe folks on meta, meso and micro levels, that, that perhaps we may be overemphasizing that and that we should look to encounter where people are and look to encounter wh who they're meeting to, to try and understand their influences, not the levels that they're, the categories that we're superimposing on, on them. So I leave it at that. Thank you very much for your attention. That's just under 45 minutes, and we have uh, so, some time for, for questions. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that detailed and extensive analysis of uh, the EU. I mean, I, for one, learned a lot from this, uh, Karen. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, probably more questions than we're going to be able to get to. Uh, but I think it's important. Um, the first question was um, asking about the EU's position uh, in the Middle East in the Hamas-Israeli uh, uh, war. I mean, could you clarify uh, what it, that is? Um, I can, yes. And that, that's something that I have been, um, I suppose, it, it's been causing a little bit of angst within the, the European community at the, at the moment. The... The, the, you have the high representative for, for foreign affairs, um, and what what the, they they've issued a statement in the last couple of days, and the, their emphasis is that there's no military solution. Okay, and they would say that the EU have emphasised initially you, Israel's right to defend itself in line with international law and international humanitarian law. It has also uh, looked for unhindered humanitarian access. It's looked for release of Hamas hostages and that civilians must be allowed to leave the, co the combat zone. It has uh, urged Israel to exercise maximum restraint to ensure the protection of, of civilians. Now, that's been an emergent position in, in that on the outbreak of, of uh, we we'll say immediately afterwards, October the 7th, you had, um, I suppose, a, a little bit of disquiet within the member states or some of the member states, in particular Ireland, uh, with regards to the support that had come immediately from the European Union to, 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 to Israel. And I think, I think their position has been clarified over the last few, few, few weeks. And I think what we have seen is the emergence of their emphasis on that there is not a military solution to this. And uh, I suppose increasing awareness of the need for respect 
or need need to be demonstrating respect for humanity, international law and inter, international humanitarian law. So I'm, I'm not sure if that completely, but the European Union's initial position did bring forward a little bit of disquiet for, 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 from from um, from the member states. Okay, thank you. Uh, and moving on, there's a, a question about uh, the map that you showed of the engagement in Georgia with the EU since 20, uh, 2008. Mm. However, this person says 25% of Georgian territory is still occupied by Russia. Does it not indicate a need of a strategy revision there? And how often is success of missions and interventions evaluated? Yes, um, well, they're continuously evaluated, and as we we teach within, as as I said, the U European Partnership, uh, the the EAP. So we encounter quite a few Georgians and uh, people from that part of the world on our programs, and I suppose ultimately, when when I talk about the capacity of the of, of the EU, you're looking at a few hundred people. So they have to pick their focus. And they have picked their focus on the monitoring mission as best they, they can. And you know I I, I think I think that they at, the, at this point in time the European Union strategy of just monitoring what's what what's going on and also gentle encouragement within that that um, I think they have to be very careful um, in, in that part of the world I, I think their, their current strategy is appropriate to the to the, the wider political environment all right thank you um this next question um thanks you number one uh and that you mentioned the sense of Im impunity uh that is another reason why conflicts exist does this mean that the rule of law, and international law are fading. And what do you think the EU and other international organizations have to do to enhance the respect for the rule of law and international law? Yeah, absolutely. That um, has, I suppose, the ultimate outcomes of current, um, I suppose, the conflict in, 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 in Ukraine and the, the situation that we have in Gaza. And the, these are all, I suppose, we're, we're, as they say, that we're at an inflection point now, that we either take these the institutions that we've created for these investigation of wrongdoing within those, that we either apply th th those principles or, or we don't. And the EU, um, I suppose has, you know, they're, they're for example, the dismantling of Hamas as as an organization. If if you're going to, um, if you if you're going to do that, well, then you have to find, you have to punish people that that have done acts that have, you know, that have been outrageous. You have to tackle their ideas, but you also have to recognize where. Those acts are uh, uh, have been broken on every side, and um, this is this is the I suppose the, the the crux of international peace building. Ultimately, that unless we are able to uh, implement and support the institutions that we have created. Well, then I, I think that we are going to end up in the future. I use the phrase political missions with an operation capability. And to be fair to the European Union, it is trying its best, I think, in, in, in that regard. If you look at Ukraine at the moment, it is helping the Ukrainian government to... Um, in its um, investigations of war crimes. It has put a significant number of people recently 
over 100 people in, into the field to help the Ukrainian government to investigate war, war crimes. And it's in the wider, the European Union is, is only one, uh, I suppose, member of that community that can support these institutions. So if we can do our part by helping say, to gather evidence, by being forthcoming, if the international community are going to deploy further capabilities to investigate, or maybe even peace building, peacekeeping missions. Like the EU has two missions in um, in Palestine at the moment. And one of them the, the, has been helping the Palestinian police to 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 um, to operate uh, the the border in Ashrafa. And it's only now that they've kept that mission there since 2006. Since, since, well, sorry, since the advent of the Hamas government. They've kept it there, but but hasn't been activated because it did it couldn't give support to, to, to Hamas. So now is an opportunity maybe to perhaps to, to, for it to demonstrate leadership uh, actually in, in the field in, in, in that regard. Okay, thank you. Um, where and how can negotiation professionals assist in the multivarious missions sponsored by the EU? EU? Well, it depends. Uh, the EU has its own capability. It's got its diplomatic missions. It's got about 140 odd delegations now around, around the world through which they channel uh, di diplomatic capabilities. It's got a mediation support team that um, that operates through the External Action Service. I'm sure if you're not familiar with the External Action Service, it's ex ex essentially the diplomatic arm of, of, of the EU. They have around 140 different delegations around the country now, around the globe now, sorry. But um, so how, how can people lock into that? They can lock in by joining the, those teams they, they, by application. But NGOs in the field um, can support the EU's work. And this is my point, that through improving the EU's own capability to work horizontally, that it can lock into and support whatever work that's that that that's happening in 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 the field. The other dimension is that by Europeans can can volunteer to to be part of a mission, and can then bring their skills to bear in in, in that environment, be it through internally internal workings of the missions, or by being somebody that works as a mentor uh, or facilitator of dialogue on behalf of the EU to, within the missions themselves. And okay, I okay. I think we have time for one more question before we um, turn it up. Maybe maybe two. Uh, let's see. Uh, here's um, a question about. Uh, well, let me just read it. When missions are initiated, at what level are mission objectives defined? Top level political leadership of uh, of member states. That's a question. Uh, commission, Parliament, uh, influence of the individual member states, or is it somebody else? Yeah, they they're actually decided at the level of what what's known as the Political and Security Committee, and that's that's attended by the ambassadors of each country, and that that's within the e EU itself. So. The, the ambassadors take their instructions from, from, from their government and that, that is their interpretation of what, what should happen in that crisis situation. They um, then come to a common approach to the problem. They have come up with a common framework for the crisis approach, essentially. And uh, within that, that could include a mission. It could include a diplomatic effort. It could include aid, whatever. So the mission is framed w w within that wider 
uh, framework. Um, so it's essentially driven by the, the positions of, of the governments of the, of, of the member state states. Then the external action service will take that that concept and then make an operational capability out of that. The, the, the missions are staffed then through requisition from the member states. They essentially say, hands up, who wants to supply people to go wherever? And uh, that can go through a process of iteration until they get sufficient numbers of people to that, that, that will travel. The most recent mission is, is Armenia. Oh, they, they, they that. Yeah. earlier this year yeah so so uh, i don't know is, is does that answer the question sure. it's essentially the, the governments themselves come up with that the, the, through the ambassadors that they, they they send to 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 europe okay one last question and then i'm going to turn this over to nicole uh given the lisbon treaty what are the critical international political economy challenges that impact the eu's conflict management approach yeah um well the the political economy is is i suppose drives every the economic dimensions of the the european union have been i suppose it's its initial drivers there, there are wider i suppose resources issues here there are you know the countries you tend to see the countries where missions are deployed are countries that European uh, countries have a strategic economic issue in. Mm. So if mm. you look at Sahel, if you look at Niger, if you look at Mali, and then you, um, you go a little bit deeper, you will see that they, they can be countries where European countries have had a strategic interest for, for, for a long, long time. And, you know, uh, this is something that you know people say well it shouldn't you know the political and the, the, that aspect isn't you know is it right to be connecting both but ultimately europe has bigger strategic interests here and uh, if those parts of the country are are peaceful if they are well ran if they've good institutions and people in those countries have you know lives that where they can have aspirations like people that live in we'll say countries where there are stronger institutions well then i say that that's work that, that that's worth pursuing and uh, the realities of of business and of p wider political economies that's going to happen and uh, you know some people would say well why shouldn't europe be in in, in the center of that all right. Well, thank you so much um, for that extensive analysis. And and I, as I said earlier, I've learned so much, and I'm I'm hoping that our our audience did too. And I'm sure it's true. Um, and I'm just wanting to also say that uh, it was wonderful having you here. I know you're leaving in December, but having you here as a fellow in the scholars program, I know everybody uh, at the center enjoyed your your company so much and shared your uh in how you shared your wisdom with with all of us so thank you thank you thank you and now i'm going to turn it over to nicole thank you thank you Donna. thank you so much donna thank you so much karen for this insightful presentation you know it's uh, it is great to reflect in this period uh, before the thanksgiving holiday on how wonderful it is to be able to come together and learn and share so we appreciate your time today and we appreciate, of course, the time of everyone who's joined us uh, over the course of all of our events thus far this semester, and of course, this one today. So uh, as we look towards wrapping up the fall semester here at PON, we have uh, one more event in two weeks with Alexandra Vokru um, back to present an update on the war in Ukraine and how we should be thinking about the conflict there. So we look forward to seeing many of you at that event. We are also preparing for our last uh, programs of the semester, uh, negotiation and leadership taking place in December in Cambridge, featuring uh, a one-day session with William Urey, one of PON's co-founders, and that will be kicking off an entire weekend of uh, anniversary events for the program on negotiation, celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. 
So thank you as ever to the incredible PON staff for all they do getting us uh, to this point. And everyone, we will have this recording available for you in just a couple of days on our website. Wishing everyone uh, who celebrates it a joyous and restful Thanksgiving. Thank you.